Welcome to A Billion Realities, where we explore all topics related to spirituality, psychology, and the power of the mind. And now your host, Jessica Garland. Have you considered starting a podcast, looking for a way to make your business a voice of authority in an industry? Then Podcast Cadet is the solution for you. Whether starting a podcast for yourself, your brand, business, school, church, or just plain fun, Podcast Cadet is here to help you navigate the waters of the podcast industry. Specializing in one-on-one -on -one consultation and training with industry professionals in fields ranging from podcast technology and editing to distribution, monetization, and even social media strategies, Podcast Cadet tailors their services to the specific needs of you and your podcast. Do you already have a podcast and trying to find ways to engage and grow your audience? Sign up for your Podcast Cadet audit today. And let us help you explore new and exciting ways to leverage your content and elevate your podcast brand to whole new levels. From consultational workshops to affordable podcast production and maintenance packages, Podcast Cadet is your one-stop shop for everything podcast related on the internet. Visit podcastcadet.com today to sign up for your consultation or training and use code REALITY20 to save 20% off your entire purchase. That website again is podcastcadet.com. Welcome back to A Billion Realities. Today on the show, we are speaking to an exceptionally talented chef and the owner of Rebirth Your Health, Joshua James Francis Lewis. Joshua has an interesting story interwoven with creativity, spirituality, culinary passion, and adversities he has faced and overcome. He has big plans for his business, Rebirth with your health, and has recently entered a competition called Favorite Chef. Welcome to the show, Joshua. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm so excited to have you on today because I personally know how phenomenal your culinary skills are, and you've just entered into a contest, which I'm so excited to discuss later on in the show. But first, so that our listeners are clued in, where are you joining us from today? I'm joining you from Afton, New York, which is in upstate New York in the U.S. It's my hometown. Excellent. So was cooking always something that you felt drawn to even as a child? It was. Um, since I was very young, uh, my parents always said I was always eating, always drinking all sorts of juices and trying things. They never had a problem with me eating foods. And then around four, when I had to go preschool, um, is when my parents and my grandparents started to realize I was developing separation anxiety. So I would manically cry before I would go to preschool. And my grandmother discovered that the only way to stop me was to have me make mac and cheese with her because apparently it was my favorite thing at the time. So she would have me do that with her and would call me down and then she would be the only one to be able to walk me up to preschool so that I would go and last, you know, like two hours <laughs> to go there. Aww. So yeah, I started out very young. Very cool. That's so cute. And would you say that you've always been a creative person all around? Definitely so. Me and my brothers, we always were outside creating stories and playing all these characters and mythic quests and everything for each other. We're always playing video games, creating Lego worlds and all this other stuff. So yeah, definitely always creative. That's amazing. I can relate to that. My childhood was similar. We did a lot of creative things back in the 80s <laughs> and early 90s. You know, you definitely had to be creative. <laughs> yeah. So what was the driving force behind you deciding to make a culinary education a priority in your life? Uh, well, it was kind of, I mean, it wasn't much straightforward. I definitely didn't start out graduating high school. I mean, like, okay, I'm going to be a chef. 
Um, I knew that the world meant a lot to me and humanity meant a lot to me. And I noticed that I was full of these immense emotions, a lot of emotions that most people don't share or maybe don't experience, but I happen to be. So it, I don't know, just pushed me into the direction of humanities and actually politics. So I, my first college was international politics and international studies was my major for the first year. And throughout that, I <clears throat> bounced back and forth from different colleges because, again, I still was going through um, separation anxiety, surprisingly, wow. so my mother and my hometown. So, but I think it was a, a test that I had to go through. It was like forcing me to break that, that boundary that I was having still. And it did kind of work in a way. Um, I did end up moving a little bit closer to home for my second college. And my best friend joined me at that college. So that obviously helped immensely. Um, but so I joined my best friend at one college. I was still going to international studies. But while I was there, um, I noticed that I was cooking a lot more for my friends. And I was going, I was enjoying eating a lot more and foods. And I was reflecting and connecting with my hometown and my past during this whole time. And then when I would visit back home, I'd cook for my cousins and other people I was so close with and friends up here. And they're like, oh, you should really be a chef. And then one day it just hit me. I was like, well, maybe you should be a chef. I was like, maybe this is because I loved, I found out through politics, I didn't really like politics. Um, international studies taught me I liked cuisine and I liked cultures and I liked how much it was an important part in many cultures and the way it like created them and developed them throughout you know thousands of years. Um, and it just clicked that day. And I was like, you know what? I will. So by my second semester, I was enrolling in culinary school. Actually, no, I didn't enroll then. I applied for my first kitchen job in my hometown at the local hotel called the Binghamton Regency at the time. Now it's Doubletree. And I was a prep cook. And I remember the my sous chef was one of my best friend's mother's mother. And she was hesitant at the time because she didn't know if I would be able to make it in the kitchen. And sure enough, none of them really thought I was going to make it in the kitchen, even the chef. So after the first like two weeks, they were like, uh, but after the, like the third week, I like rose and shine and they were just like, whoa, where'd this guy come from? And I was just like immersed in that. And I realized like I had to like show myself more and just, you know, learn everything about it. And I don't know, something clicked there too in that time. And it really just ignited my passion. That is so cool. So it kind of like was always a part of you, but it was later on, there was some sort of you know, aha moments where it was like, oh, wow. Yeah. This is like my path. Yes. Nowadays I coined it my rebirth, my rebirths, many rebirths in the life. <laughs> and you know what? It's interesting that you say that because that's, it's incorporated into the name of your business. So Correct. that's awesome. Yeah. So who are some of your biggest inspirations in the culinary world and why? Well, so definitely my grandmother, obviously, as I touched base earlier, because she was so prominent in the beginning. And uh, then both my grandmothers, actually, because they were the most, I guess, creative and the ones that cooked the most in our family. Um, when I started to become more serious about culinary school and culinary as my passion, at the time is when Food Network was actually becoming a big thing and booming. So I was early on, I was first exposed to Emeril. So he obviously became someone that I just would look up to because I was, you know, from the boondocks of upstate New York. We didn't really have cable or anything like that. It was happened to be a PBS channel that aired him. So I got to watch him and I was very excited about that, but I didn't understand half the stuff he was talking about. And it, that pushed me to want to learn more about that too. So I was like, you know, what? I'm sick of not knowing what he's talking about. Like I should be able to know what he's talking about. Um, and then from then as we grew and I was in high school, you know, cable came around. I was going to my best friend's house all the time. And that's when Rachel Ray became big. And actually, she became one of my biggest inspiring people because I just loved how happy she was and like jovial. And she was just so like real and she's from upstate. And I just clicked with that. And I was just like, wow, you know what? And she and she really knows what she's talking about. So I didn't learn anything incorrect from her. And, you know, those were my like two like first beginning actual professional inspirations. That's amazing. And from then, my other inspirations came from like really true chefs that I worked for. Die Hard, Donna Abramson being one of them. Um, Robert Diaco, all from New York City. They were like such huge mentors to me and taught me so much. It was like incredible. Wow. So let's talk about school. Where did you go to culinary school? What was the experience like? So I attended the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park, New York, because I'm from upstate. So it's just my backyard, basically. 
um, which was amazing. It was probably the best decision I ever made in my life, clearly, because now here I am. <laughs> um, <laughs> so excited to, I mean, it's just a beautiful campus. Everything was beautiful about the environment, the people, people I met. I was actually the youngest in my class at the time, which I thought I was coming in late because I was like, you know, switching majors and stuff. And I was totally, not, you know, not in the clear mind of what I was like, entering into, but I'm really happy I did it. And it was incredible. Very cool. So do you feel a specific type of mindset or personality is necessary to become a chef? Um, a, a manic one, <laughs> one that can handle the <laughs> crazy and the craziest moments of your life happening and then problem solving them. So yes, a very problem solving and kind of calm under pressure person for sure. Okay. High energy as well. Oh, definitely. You have to be able to just keep rolling with the punches. Yeah, I've seen that in action and it's, it's a lot. <laughs> yes. It's hectic. The hardest part is to maintain the positive attitude during the whole thing. <laughs> Keep going, everyone. Right. And then you have some of these personality, TV personality chefs who honestly are such a bad example for how you should like behave at a business. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, so. Yeah, because like you can't act like that in the real world and get away with it, right? So, uh, no, especially if you want the respect from your staff. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what would you say became your forte during culinary training? Um, like in regards to like style or cuisines, or I mean, anything that you feel that you really excelled in, like what area or what style of cuisine? I mean, anything that comes to mind that you felt like, yeah, this is my thing. Um, hmm, that's interesting because I mean, I was, I went to school for my major was culinary. We had the choice of culinary or bacon and pastry. I always liked bacon and pastry. And it's obviously something that I wanted to do. And I stepped into finally, especially it's in part of my company. I have a baking company as well. Um, but initially I thought I wanted to be a, you know, just a typical chef, like running the restaurant. But then as I actually worked in the restaurants and I watched really talented chefs that this was their life and they loved it. Robert Dyko and Donna being two of those examples. I saw how consuming it was and how they literally became masters in all aspects of like the culinary world, not just working the line and cooking savory food, but they had to learn sweets. They had to learn baking and pastry. They had to learn management skills. They had to learn therapy. They had to learn medical. They had to learn every trade and ordering and purchasing. You know, so many hats are worn by the chef that people don't realize. And they just, you know, they see what's on TV, but they actually don't know what's behind the whole scenes. And, you know, if you were to be such an, I mean, a mean, nasty person, like some of these chefs are, like, I don't, I don't see how they would thrive as a restaurant, but. Mm -hmm, right. So was your, so would you say that your forte was like, basically. Oh so anyway, so from that, I guess stemmed, I guess my forte would become like adaptability. Like I just learned how to adapt and learn to every situation and to rise above it and master it in a way. I'm still learning, of course, tremendously. You learn every day, but I don't sure. think that into like, I'm just a patient chef or I'm just like, I, I'm, I'm becoming a chef and a chef is a man of many hats or a woman of many hats. I love that. That's amazing. Very well said. Thank you. How did it feel receiving your degree and what were your initial moves once you graduated? It was complete euphoria I would literally was crying of course on stage I'm very emotional like I, <laughs> um, I was so happy that my grandmother who just passed this past year Aww. was there um, the one who got me started <clears throat> oh sorry a little emotional <laughs> yeah but, um, it was amazing it was a lot of testament to like the hard work I put in the people I met like everything that I meant to start this journey becoming a chef yeah now you're getting me teary eyed because I already know you and I love you so much. And so I could just imagine how you feel. And I just want to give you a hug. <laughs> I received it. <laughs> That's really beautiful. So you were super just ecstatic. Oh, definitely. Definitely. And, and uh, you know, what, what were your moves? Like, what were your plans? <laughs> Did you have a plan? Well, not really. I mean, my brothers lived in the city at the time, so I had that option, but I didn't know if I wanted to necessarily do that because everyone was doing it. Um, 
I definitely, there was a financial burden after school too. So I was like, you know, poor student as well. So moving home was obviously the first step. Um, from there, I just touched base with my best friends, my quarter group, talked over issues, met with other people that, you know, I respected their opinions and inevitably, full circle, this kind of comes around, but my best friend, Brandon, who moved to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania with his cousins, well, with his cousin and her wife, um, they're like, hey, this big casino's opening, Sands Casino's opening in Bethlehem. And I was like, what, really? So I looked into it and they're like, yeah, Emerald's opening a restaurant. <laughs> Oh like, wow. So I applied and I got my first job out of culinary school three months after working for one of my first inspirations and I guess chef mentors. Wow. How crazy how this life is sometimes when it comes to, you know, things coming full circle, <laughs> coming back around. It truly Amazing. is. <laughs> the fact that this was your inspiration and you watched this person you know you were in school still like high school and yep. then you end up actually going to school for that and working for the guy wow it's crazy <laughs> it's crazy Small world. it is so you and I have something in common we're both on a spiritual journey what would you say triggered your personal spiritual journey um well probably the fact that I just exactly knew you were going to say this to me so my intuition and my slight psychic ability starts developing. <laughs> but um, I mean, I've always been a spiritual kid. I grew up religious and, you know, Christianity, which I've since learned that I don't really follow. I've become a different type of spiritual person where I just very open-minded and accepting of all sorts of methodologies, ideologies, theologies. You know, I just, I believe that's the best way to be personally. Um, yeah helps to reduce stress and fighting and conflict if you just yeah. listen and approach people and want to talk about things um so from that uh, my the biggest trigger for my spiritual awakening was the dark period that entered <clears throat> when i was in new york city which i happened to develop an addiction mm-hmm Sorry, I'm emotional again. It's hard. I know you went through a lot with that, and we've talked a lot about this this topic. So take your time. You know, I think it's amazing that you're you know coming on and sharing your story because I feel like it, I know that it's going to help so many people. It is, and it's important yeah. because you know it just shows it can happen to anybody. <laughs> Definitely. It doesn't discriminate. <laughs> Sorry. That's so, all right. Anyways, so I developed an addiction to meth, uh, which kind of took over my life for about six years. Uh, wow. I didn't realize it was that long. That's a while. This. Um, I did. <clears throat> Sorry. But um. that's all right. People, people, people uh, connect more when, you know, someone's being real and authentic and genuine. So I, I'm all for people fully expressing their emotions, you know? I do too. Thank you. Yeah, um, of course. But, uh, so anyways, I mean, it didn't, develop, it didn't develop out of anything really malicious. It was just kind of what I was going through at the time as a young gay man in New York City and stuff. And do it with a lot of stress and a heavy duty stress load as a chef and this job um, definitely mm -hmm. <clears throat> extracts a toll from you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but it's not over, it's not over, it's not not overcomable. Um, right. But anyway, so it lasted for, you know, about six years and it did pretty much destroy inevitably a lot of things that I created or had created New York City. Um, <clears throat> and it forced me to move home, which is probably the best thing that ever happened to me because it really just brought me back to my roots. Right. And allowed me to start to have that breakthrough, that awakening. Definitely. 
And that's when I started to like read into Buddhism more and chakras and balancing energies. And probably most importantly, angels. Yeah. That's you and I have talked a lot about this. This is the type of stuff that we really connected on spirituality, angels, and spirit guides. Absolutely. So, and definitely started you, to really notice these things really prominently too in my life. Like you said, the signs and the spiritual guides, certain animals reappearing, um, certain yeah. things that meant a lot to my grandma and me or different family members. Um, yeah. And my brother and I had started talking about it because he started having his own spiritual awakening for his own reasons. And that really helped because, you know, at the same time, you and I were talking about this as well. So like this three trio talking about it and it really helped me to be more clear in my thoughts and my understanding of things and really let the light, the light in. <clears throat> yep. We all helped each other during that period, you know. And it was, what was interesting too, is that we had all been through some dark situations, difficult times that triggered it. It's true. And it, in that darkness, it still brought us together because we had that same common light inside. Uh, Pope. Definitely. And, you know, as I started to read into it more and understand it and, you know, connecting with angels and the people that were help, trying to help me secretly that I didn't realize it's when I really started to come and have some serious breakthroughs and understood my addiction more and why it was happening. And I started making those changes to get out of it. It took time, obviously it took a very long time and a relapse, but I got over it finally through just mm -hmm. strong belief and love, self-love is the most important. Yeah. And I letting go of all that pain in the past, everything you can't control anymore. Yeah. Let it go. It takes a strong person and a lot of self-love to do that. But it, like you said, it's doable. It's doable right. when you, when you make that decision. And anybody can do it with the right support system, which I was thankfully blessed with. Yeah. So and since then, I've been clean and sober for going on two years. Amazing. So amazing. Yep. Thank God. You're on such a great yeah, path. Perfect. Yeah. Beautiful. But through food, I traversed all these problems too, though. It may have been a small part in what happened and became of this situation, but at the same time, it's what I utilized to get through everything. I got I used to get through my anxiety issues. I used to get through this. You know, it provides mm -hmm. a strong structure in this family, this core unit of people that are going to the same thing you are. Yeah. Or, or worse. Or worse, exactly. I, I, it's funny that you say that because one of my next questions was, how did your spiritual journey affect your culinary career? Um, well, yes, it definitely molded me to being a very compassionate chef and absolutely seeing the need for that compassion understanding because I was working with people who are going through the same thing, worse or different, but in their own respects, a, you know, a tough time. And that's what the kitchen, you know, collects people like that for a reason, because it creates a strong unit that they need of people who understand their situation and won't judge them and will help them get out of the situation. Yes, absolutely. That's amazing. How would you describe your personal process of spiritual awakening? Because I think there are some commonalities, but everybody has their own unique experience what would you describe that like well as i touched on it happened during my addiction period and i actually got very sick physically sick for like almost a week i was bedridden and it was in that time that actually allowed me to get past the hardest points of relapse and addiction and that's coming down off of it and trying to de detox your body. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess in that moment, I, when I started to connect a lot with my dreams I was having, very deep and vivid, very vivid dreams where I would awake so emotionally affected and so mentally affected by them. 
that mm-hmm. I just had to listen to the stories. And I know I reached out to you many times, many times about them, trying to analyze them and my brothers. And it really, it just, they were just these stepping stones. It was like watching a map unfold. And it was just like my steps in the map. And it was just, you know, leading me into the right direction. Um, the next yeah. step is Grateful Journey, which was then, of course, um, going into reading and discovering different th- thoughts and, you know, a lot of into Buddhism and a lot into angels and ascended masters and, you know, the path of, you know, just being enlightened. Definitely. Yeah. What types of challenges arose during those years of your awakening and how did you handle them? A lot of the challenges that I seem to experience are happening was almost just being able to see the truth in a lot of people that were around me. People I may have thought were my friends or like really close to me that end up were just using me or sabotaging or psychic vampires is absorbing energy. Yeah. And I realized that I'm a very strong, I'm a, like a complete cancer zodiac. So I'm a very intuitive the emotions and everything. And I just would absorb all these people's emotions and everything that affected me largely in the kitchen. And it took a long, many, many years, probably 15 years of me doing this. And I, I'm on my 16th year doing it now. So pretty long time to realize that I needed to create strong barriers to protect myself in order to succeed through this job and to make a good impression because of this type of environment. Such a great point to share with people because I'm huge on that. Protecting yourself and your energy and staying in your own energy instead of, you know, joining up with someone else's energy or absorbing that person's energy. It's so important when you work with a lot of different personalities and people. And when many really are, you know, out there to take the energy from you because they need it to survive themselves, you know, you have to protect yourself. You give an inch, people take a mile. It's a very true Certain, Certain types. Yeah. Especially narcissists sociopaths psychopaths they're they only care what they can get from you and that's it they don't there's yeah (laughs) complete energy and if you don't have those walls up they're manipulate manipulate you and just you know just keep using you so you got to become aware of yourself that's where the self-love comes into self-respect absolutely it's such great advice and you know such a great message to send out um i think a lot of people (laughs) probably need to hear that because you and I went through that at the same time. We did. It was, it was so tough, but it thank was. you to fall onto and talk to and be open and non-judgmental. No, totally. nothing was ever judged. And that's so important when you're trying I to agree. break you or help somebody never make them feel like attack or pressure. Just make them feel oh, so yeah. and just loved. Absolutely. That's why when you said support system earlier, it's so important to know who you can trust, who you can turn to, and who's going to be there to listen, not judge, and be able to kind of just comfort you in that way. Yeah, like a mother. Yeah, totally. Um, I wanted to ask you this. So what do you feel sets you apart about the way you chose to perceive all of those challenges that you went through, especially in hindsight, looking back on the situation? That's what sets me apart is that no matter what I was going through or doing or maybe experiencing in a dark side or dark way, I always held that little bit of light in me. My soul really was very bright in a very tiny little way always inside of me. And no matter what I did, it would speak up so loud. Even if it was like a one word thing in my head, it would just speak so loudly that it would resonate so strongly with me and that it it would literally deter me from doing the too wrong of a thing, something that was irreversible. And I was always wow. thankful for that. And I mean, even in a dream, this one most powerful dream I had during that time in New York and where I swear to this day, and I know for sure that I walked with Satan and he showed me all the things I could have, everything. And I was so, it was so real life, but so surreal at the same time. And some of the images seemed familiar, like the place we're at and like the scenery, 
And then we got to this end of the path. There was just this huge wall, kind of like in Mordor in Lord of the Rings. And I was just remember that because I love that whole trilogy and, you know, Tolkien and his world. Okay. And I knew it meant something strong in my dream, you know, the Dark Lord. And then at that yeah. moment, some elderly bald man just threw a cloak over me and just threw me off the path and said, no, <gasps> not him. And then I just awoke. And wow. I awoke crying my eyes out like bawling in tears terrified because i am so real and scary and that wow. was like the biggest wake up moments i ever had and to this day it just sticks with me and it was just so real yeah I had to pay attention to not just what people say but everything from my dreams to plants to animals to certain circumstances driving on the road everything i listen to and i pay attention to and i think that's what sets me apart is that I allow myself to be open-minded to everything and extend um, a receptor yes. to the of the universe and what they're trying to tell me and lead me to, to be open to that and literally open your heart and everything to me. Yeah. Let your I rem- oh. So I just wanted to say that I, I'm just reflecting back on conversations we've had um, you know, within the last couple of years about the different types of clairs, like clairvoyant, claircognizant. And I was like, if I know anyone who's all of them, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think I should be flattered, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should, because it just shows, like you just described, how connected you are to literally everything of, around you, to yourself. And it's just so impressive to me that you went through such a difficult addiction and probably the type of addiction that like completely shuts parts of those, you know, those parts of you down in in many ways. And then to be able to kick that addiction and get to the point of connection where you're at now, it's pretty phenomenal, you know, it is phenomenal. And it's, it's, it's still strange every day because I read and I watch new things. I'm always trying to learn. And I just was recently watching this episode on healing on the Gaia channel. And it was talking about how humans literally can overcome almost everything with their minds and their bodies. Cause we are super humans. Um, yeah. But they spoke on. Mm-hmm. So um, and in this healing episode, it was speaking about how angels, um, Actually, I'm sorry, it was not in this episode. I was reading an article about this, about angels to my mother and my grandparents and my aunt, who became interested in angels at the time, this car ride, ah, right, drinking coffee. Okay. And that was a perfect time to start delving into this. So I was talking to them, I was like, well, s- angels whisper and they give us like gentle instructions. And I, you know, I was reading and it tells that sometimes we just ignore them too much. And at that time, the angels actually will go to the demons, which as I learned, studying spirituality there are these evil crazy things that you know we're taught in religious schools necessarily but they're more or less like lessons that we're supposed to be learned and sometimes mostly hard lessons we have to learn so at the time the angels approached the demons and they're like listen i can't get through to joshua help me so i honestly feel like what i went through with my addiction was one of those times where they had to go because i wasn't listening to whatever the lessons were at that time and i didn't was very unclear of everything yeah ultimately led me down to that first initial like spiritual road of like whoa like it was you know through a trauma like you know most traumas start that um and then from that is Mm -hmm. when i started to read about claire's and the dreams really triggered that because i was like wow i keep having these dreams like like really vivid dreams like i feel like people are trying to tell me something and i probably should be listening so i you know started talking to you my brothers find all these places on online these great websites you know analyzing dreams and then it segued into claire's and like why you might be having these dreams so that's when i started to realize that i was definitely clear sentient emotionally psychic that i definitely feel everyone's feelings around me and then some and i try to explain that to people because sometimes in the situation i can't explain myself i get very wrapped up in my emotions and people think i'm you know angry or aggressive but Really, it's just I'm so wrapped up in my emotions I can't explain myself. Um, and yep. that's because I'm picking up everyone around me, especially in the kitchen, their emotions are going through, and then it intensifies by like a hundred. And it's just it's it's the craziest thing ever <laughs> I experienced. But I mean, wow. 
So I've heard this, you know, obviously I have a lot of people that come on my show uh, with, you know, that it went through addiction and overcame it and, or, or, or are working on that. Right. Yeah. And one of the common denominators is being an empath because it's so hard for empaths to process their emotions. And before they can learn how to do that, it's a lot easier to use a substance that helps them to do that until they realize that that's not the answer. Do you yes. know what I mean? I absolutely so, agree with that statement. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I didn't and, only go through that. I also had like a drinking problem during culinary school too. And throughout many of my years as a budding chef, which many of us go through and they actually totally. just about it in culinary school. They're like, listen, probably two thirds of you are going to develop an addiction. We're just being honest. Like this is the type of job and life that you're choosing. Wow. So they encourage you obviously to figure out outlets then and there. Um, obviously most of us are too drunk during that class to do that at the time. But <laughs> yeah. We figure it out later on. Hopefully. Of course. You know, I I can relate to to all of it really. I've had my own struggles with being excessive with certain things and, you know, escaping, not being able to handle my emotions in the past, but um, I'm so grateful for my own. Uh, I've had many awakenings, like you described these many kind of rebirths. <laughs> I yes. feel like that that's what happens to me. It's not, it wasn't one big thing that happened. And then obviously, it, you know, that it was done. It's been a process of a lot of awakenings and I make progress in one particular area of my life with one period. And then it's like, I have another one and I work on something else, but I'm so grateful as well for my spirituality uh, insight and everything I've learned and continue to learn because if it helps me with one thing, the most I would say is, is how to handle and process my emotions or how to release lower vibrational emotions and replace those with, you know, trying to focus on what I'm grateful for and, you know, love and appreciation and higher vibrational um, emotions. And it sounds just so similar to your, you know, your story. I mean, I know that it is. Oh, it absolutely is. I mean, I mean, just, being able to talk to somebody that has those similar situations and really just like ping ponging back and forth. It literally was just like watching like hundreds of doors opening in the hours that we would speak together. And then you know, it's just yeah. so much light in and so much understanding. And that's so important. Yep. Definitely. So, I mean, we kind of touched on this already, but if there's anything else you think of, like, in what ways have your adversities helped shape the person that you've become? I mean, it helped shape me to become, I mean, I used to think that I wasn't able to do things or overcome challenges. I thought I was restricted by where I was raised, income, everything. And as I became a chef and I realized my income wasn't going to increase very quickly anytime soon, I had to figure out a way to still be happy and still, you know, do things in life that everyone else does and be balanced. So I mm -hmm. think it really ultimately forced me to just really become adaptable with life and accepting of what's happening and this life that I was born into. Like understanding that you're born into this life for a reason. And that's one of the biggest things also that I think I realized during my spiritual awakening was realizing mm -hmm. we all have destinies, we all have preset destinies for ourselves. Um, that we forget once we're born, but yeah. also our soul mission and our soul destiny. And I think once I realized what that concept was, it really also helps to change who I was and adapt to my life and circumstances and ultimately yeah. help to heal myself literally from inside out. Definitely. Rid myself of that negativity and all that toxic, toxic energies that were just lingering and attached to me from other people, myself, everything I went through, for like sure rebirth absolute death and rebirth like just whoosh, shed it burn it and phoenix grow. keep growing phoenix rising, phoenix rising. <laughs> so i want to touch on this because it's so cool what you're doing so i know from our recent chat 
you told me that you've been teaching online culinary classes and I've, I've seen on your Facebook and other, you know, from chatting with you, it's been going really well. It's been quite the hit is teaching rewarding for you and why it's absolutely rewarding for me because I am definitely a student. Like I appreciate a very good teacher that will connect with the student and has real life experiences and open-mindedness and willingness to listen to them. And I found out in the kitchen, like one of the hardest things to do was just being, do this, make this. And it's like, well, show me exactly how to do it first so I can make it perfectly exactly how you want it again. So I feel it's a very powerful and very important part, especially in the kitchen and being a chef is to instruct and teach everyone that comes in there from dishwashers to receivers, anyone, and your cooks, exactly what you want. And, you know, and more so, like teach them about the whole trade and everything to get them inspired and excited and become a better cook for themselves and for you. For sure. Very cool. Love it. I can't wait for you to work with my son. I'm so excited <laughs> to do that. To <laughs> He's going to love that. He's going to culinary high school so that our listeners are clued into what we're talking about. Um, over here in Serbia, they get to choose which type of high school they go to where they could learn a trade. And I love that they offer that. You know, I did that too when I was um, in high school, but I went for cosmetology. I'm really excited that he's going for culinary because he's a very hands on, creative, you know. He's a water sign yeah. like you. He's a Scorpio. Yep. <laughs> yep. Love the creative, tactical environments. Engaging. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so excited for that. That's so great for him. Yeah. I'm excited for him too. I think he's, I know that he's going to love it. So what are your plans for merging your culinary skills and spiritual knowledge? And why is it important to you? Well, I feel that... I've always felt that through food, you can heal almost anything in the world because it's lasted for our entire lifetimes. We don't exist without food and eating and all throughout the generations and, you know, different civilizations, food has always held such an important, important role in the cultural and social aspects of life. Um, so I feel like being this positive role model of the chef that I went through everything I did do and awakened, I'll be able to help anyone who comes through my kitchens and, also it just speaks through my food. Like I'm able to create food and dishes that I know are going to be good for people. I mean, not just necessarily nutrition wise, which most of them are, but also like, I know it's going to help their soul. I know it's going to help them feel really good and better in that, at least that moment of their life, which I've experienced when I went out to eat. So I also I became a good chef because I love to eat so much and I eat emotionally. So I'll pinpoint what emotion I'm having and I'll eat that right food that's for that. So I can kind of pick up on that sometimes when I'm cooking for people. Well, actually most times I'm cooking for people. And that's amazing. Yeah, wow. So, so most dishes are literally personally crafted for people when I'm able to do it. Um, yeah, I think it's just a little personal touch. I've always just developed through the spiritual awakening and my love of this industry and being a chef. This is why I'm so happy that you're sharing your story today. I mean, that's just such a gift, you know? Like, really? I'm blessed and thankful every day for it. And... Beautiful. So let's chat about this exciting competition that you've entered called Favorite Chef. Can you tell yes. us how you heard about it? Well, I was visiting my mom because my niece and nephew were visiting, um, who I love dearly. And as I was walking in the door, I received a text message for this Instagram post I replied to called Favorite Chef. As I was reading through the post, it was like, do your chefs, I mean, do your friends and family call you their favorite chef all the time, blah, blah, blah. I was like, yes, yes. So I kept mm -hmm. answering yes to all the questions that were posted. I was like, well, you know what, why not go for it? They always say just go for things. Yeah. So, and it's to win an award, but also be featured in Bon Appetit magazine, which would be I mean, just phenomenal. Um, Definitely. Make me feel a different level of achievement in my career and this time in my life and a vindication in a way, I believe. Um, but also just allow me to reach more people and hopefully spread the positive and good word and what I went through in my journey. Um, so 
when I entered my mom's house, I got a text message saying that they accepted my application, I guess it was. And from then I fill out my personal profile and everything, did all the little prompts they had me do and this and that. And now we're in the running and voting is February 16th, this Tuesday. Um, so I hope everybody goes out and votes for me uh, to be their favorite chef. I hope so too. And I think that you need to win. <laughs> it would definitely be definitely a big blessing for sure. I mean, the money alone would help me to get out of some financial circumstances and hopefully be able to really get going on opening why my dream, which is still developing, but obviously I've begun it with Rebirth Your Health, which was kind of a, uh, I guess it is an umbrella concept because yeah. I would, you know, as an emotional water sign, I was personify everything with water. So when it rains, it pours. <laughs> so it sucks when it rains and pours, you don't have a nice umbrella. So I kind of went through situations in life where I realized I could do little side jobs to help keep me floating and not have me so much drowned out in life and what life throws at you. So yeah. your health is an umbrella company where I have a catering company, baking, um, my teaching classes now, and you know, it's just going to keep growing. It is growing. It already has. And I'm so excited to, for, for it to continue and, and expand. And I saw on the actual competition, I did a little reading a little mm -hmm. research and you have some pretty phenomenal plans if you win this competition with the money that you're getting. I mean, it will really benefit humanity, the community, society. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So uh, touched on a little bit um, prior. It was, so I'm yes. still <laughs> looking, obviously, but um, it's not just going to be like a restaurant, but I mean, it's going to be a restaurant where people literally can go and I wanted to develop where, as much as possible, I can cook personally for people, but you can come literally feeling how you feel or going through what you're going through and this and that. And I kind of create meals to help people heal on a very human, biological, and then spiritual level. And then also incorporate a spiritual center into my restaurant somehow, um, whether it be a separate room where we can talk and have private sessions with people. Um, or just, you know, me incorporating what I went through, through my food and the environment that people will be dining in. It's amazing. So really holistic approach. Yes, absolutely. Like kind of, kind of like a, a wellness and culinary experience. Right. <laughs> in a one. sustainable one as well, because I want to, obviously I'll have gardens and this and that because they were important and obviously to be the yeah. chef and restaurant, but also to me as well, because, you know, just being in touch with plants and seeing colors and the smells like it just really clears up negative energy and helps you feel really good definitely absolutely and you can always so, get and also in that aspect too i do i kind of want to model my hiring process to help people going through situations i went through that are really you know trying to make that breakthrough and get them through their struggle definitely the foundation something that they can you know be happy with family yeah. Well, guys, you've heard his story. It's phenomenal. He's such a great person. He's so talented. One of the best chefs I've ever been lucky enough to experience. <laughs> the food that you make is unbelievable. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, my love. It's so, so delicious. Um, what kind of advice do you have for young people who are considering an education in culinary art? I would advise do not just follow into everything that you watch on TV. It's not necessarily exactly how it's going to be in real life. And most kitchens are very chaotic and not cookie cutter like that. Um, right. It requires strength, adaptability, um, resources, and creative thinking on your feet at all times so to like, train yourself that way you know in your younger years like try to learn how to multitask more try doing little simple things that help you to you know learn how to train your smell and your hearing that's a huge thing that I I do in the kitchen and I actually noticed my mother helps me baking now she's developing a really strong sn nose and hearing for when things wow. are too much or they're burning she's like Tasha something burning I'm like <gasps> and then like you know I don't even know <laughs> now before I do 
But, you know, those are important little things that you can, you know, can develop at any time in your life, you know, just sitting anywhere, you can train your smell, or your hearing. Right, right. Um, so yeah, I think just being open minded and just keep yourself always learning different aspects. It's not just cooking, like you got to be, a, like I said, a medic, sometimes you have to be a therapist many, many, many times in the kitchen. So is legacy important to you? And why? Um, not legacy for a personal reason, just legacy for an example, a positive example right. for people. Learn right. what I went through my mistakes and what I've overcome. Um, hopefully people can connect with me in all different levels, emotionally, spiritually. And I think that would be my biggest thing. Yeah. Not so much a personal legacy, but just to be my story shared and hopefully people will be able to use it and resonate and use it to overcome right yeah makes sense i i felt like that would be the case that's why i asked you that question <laughs> because I, I i know it's important to you to help other people to navigate you know what so, so similar things to what you went through so yeah, definitely yeah and before we leave what do you want the world to know about you um i want the world to know that I am happy and love my life and love everything in my life, even the negative situations at times, because they're just lessons that the universe yeah. is throwing at us to become stronger. And as long as we stay happy and in humor and laughing, then you know what? We can do anything we want and achieve things and live the longest lives possible. Beautiful. And where can people vote for you? And guys, before he tells you, Please consider voting for Joshua. He deserves this more than anyone I know. So <laughs> your voting will be on the Favorite Chef page, which I will be posting. They only allowed to post it on voting day. So on the 16th of Tuesday, it will be voted. And it will have the link right there on the page to go to, to cast mm -hmm. your So I'll be posting it on Instagram and Facebook. And I'm sure many friends will also be sharing it for me as well, which I'm very thankful for. Definitely. Do you know the what do you know the website yet? Like is it um, www? Let me check I'll get it for you right now. Yeah, perfect. That way we can just tell our listeners because I think it's an easy one to remember. I believe so. Yep. So it's favechef.com, F-A-V-C-H-E-F.com. Perfect. Joshua J F Lewis is my profile. Awesome. Do you want people to find you on social media? Sure, absolutely. I mean, I'll be sharing shout. social media as my primary platform. Yeah. You're right. You can shout that out too if, if you want people to find you on Instagram well, I have or at Chef of at Chef of Change on Instagram and Joshua J F Lewis on Facebook. Wonderful. Or Joshua James Francis Lewis, I should say, on Facebook. Joshua James Francis Lewis. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Well, I really appreciate you being on today. I just love and adore you. You already know that. I'm sure I love that this as well so much. <laughs> Thank you. I I know that this episode is going to have a really huge impact. So thank you so much for sharing your story with us and it was deep. So. Yeah. It was deep and personal but very very moving. Your story is is a true inspiration. So thank you. You're most welcome. I appreciate you for allowing me to share with you via your beautiful podcast and I just love having you as a friend and I'm very blessed and thankful for you as well for this moment and this time. Same all around. So I'm excited for you to win this competition. We're going to make sure that that happens. <laughs> Let's, do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Great. Keep yeah. Thanks again. Take Thank care, everyone. So we'll, yeah. We'll have you on again soon. Looking forward Bye. to it. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Love you all.
Thank you for listening to this episode of A Billion Realities with your host, Jessica Gerlach. Visit us online at abillionrealities.com and follow us on social media at A Billion Realities. A Billion Realities is available on Spreaker, iHeartRadio, iTunes, Spotify, Alexa, Reach.tv, or your favorite podcast service. A Billion Realities is a proud member of the HC Universal Network family of podcasts. For more great episodes and content, visit hcuniversalnetwork.com today. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. And until next time, remember, we are all the one of a billion realities.